Yes. But okay. Which is giving me heads up. Uh, you want to kick it off? I love my life. <laughs> I'll get it. Hi. Uh, it's great to see so many people here today. Uh, I'm Richard Brady. I'm the president of Matrix Consulting Group, and I'm leading a group of consultants who's working with uh, the Reno Police Department on what its uh, patrol staffing needs are and how to allocate those uh, resources. So we put together uh, a presentation, but I just want to take about 10 or 15 minutes of this meeting to talk to you a little bit about who we are and the work that we've been contracted to do. Uh, and some of the things that we'd like to hear from you about the, your needs in the community. Um, but I, we really want to hear from you and we don't want to ask 20 questions and get 20 answers. We want to have this uh, more open so that we can get these are as part of this process. So before I walk through that, Chief, do you have anything to say to get it started? Um, sure, I will not take 10 minutes because I was late. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll be extra brief then. Uh, Catherine, the Reno Police Department, uh, as a lot of people have heard or know, as I see some a lot of stakeholders in the room, uh, we are working on what does patrol deployment look like for the Reno Police Department and how can we better serve the community by deploying our resources in a manner that makes sense. Uh, so I will dive into why this happened. I don't particularly understand the schedules that we have and the days off, and it's a little confusing for me. And I realized that I don't know that we're doing this the best way possible. I felt like it was a little outside of my wheelhouse to be the one to, to try and determine what a better model would look like using all of the data that, that the consulting group is using. And so we were very excited to be able to do this. So a couple of things that are a priority for me is one, um, you know, are we on the right shifts, on the right schedules? Are we handling calls the way that we need to call it? We have enough free time to do the proactive work that needs to be done. And then are we deploying resources into the right space? And does our, um, do our boundaries and, and geographical design of how officers are responding to calls, do they match the needs of the community for um, both the response time, but also the ability to, to provide those services and the resources once they get there. And then um, are they able to really um, look at how we have, what we have in the street, when and where. And so that's kind of the stuff that we started off with that we're really interested in. I think that there's a, a nexus to not only the service that we're providing to the community, but also the well-being of the officers. And so looking at you know, can they decompress from work and their time off? And do they get the proper training that they need based on their schedules? Do they get sleep? Um, all those things are, are important and they coincide with what we're doing here. Um, a big a important part of this to me was getting some community input and outreach and making sure that the community says, hey, this is what we're looking for. This is what's working. This is what's not working. These are expectations. I uh, don't want to derail the meeting with anything that gets too in the weeds or specific about resources, and I'm sure you'll cover some of those kind of talking points. So I do have the ability, I have uh, Lieutenant Autry here with me, that he can handle some like one-on-one -on -one questions if something goes, you know, that you really need some help with, and then we can also do some follow-up later. So if anybody feels like that's the, the need, we can also address that as we move forward. Thank you, Chief. I never have talking points or notes, so if I miss something and I want me to do something else, I can have on. Well, I, I've got something to add too. That you can add. Yeah. You know, I guess I guess for me, if the chief doesn't understand the system, it's a good reason to have it study. <laughs> yeah. So again, I'm Rick Brady and I work with Majors Consulting Group, and I want to talk a little bit about the work that we're going to be doing here today. And as the chief mentioned, it's really important in a study like this to hear from the community. Because uh, if we just do our work in a vacuum, statistical kind of work, working with the police department, we don't understand the perspectives of the people who are receiving the services and what the, your needs are. So this is an essential part of any study today. Uh, so first, uh, let me talk a little bit about Matrix Consulting Group. Is that going to go up on the screen? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, we are in our 21st year as providing services to local government. We only work for local, local governments. While we provide a lot of services, we do public work studies, we did human resources study in Reno. 
uh, early on in our uh, existence. But our biggest area is law enforcement. We've worked with over 400 police departments. So here in Nevada, we work with Las Vegas Metro, uh, Elko. We just got signed on to work with Henderson. Uh, but we've worked in 46 states around the country and three provinces in Canada. So a lot of work doing a wide variety of things for uh, our police clients, including staffing and deployment kinds of studies. Uh, we are known as being a fact based firm and it's important for a study like this, looking at what the staffing needs are and how best to deploy them. Um, but um, <clears throat> we, uh, so you need facts in order to be able to do that. But we work closely with the stakeholders, both within the department and the community to understand the qualitative nature of, uh, of what those needs are. Um, our team, we've got about five or six people working in this project. Uh, half of them are people who used to be up to senior managers in some other police department and are now full-time police consultants with us or people like me. Um, I founded the firm 21 years ago, but I've been doing police consulting for 43 years, actually. Uh, so that blended kind of uh, approach to developing a project team really works well for our clients. We don't have subcontractors. We have all the expertise we need in-house. So a little bit about uh, the study. Um, so again, as the chief said, uh, our study is focused on patrol. It's not looking at investigations. It's not looking at records or anything within the department, but it's field services uh, only. Uh, so that's direct the people who are uh, the, uh, driving around the city every day uh, and some ancillary field service types of functions. But it's really all about, do you have the right number of people to serve the community? as measured by their ability to respond effectively, like quickly enough to request for service when you call up uh, or uh, dial 911. Uh, but also, as the chief mentioned, to be proactive. It's critically important that police officers, patrol officers, aren't spending all of their time just responding to calls. Because uh, if that's all they're doing, they're not gonna have a rapid response, first of all. But second of all, they're not gonna have any time to be engaged with you, to understand your problems, to partner with you, and uh, to get out and talk to you about your problems or things like that. So in order uh, to do this study, um, we're focusing on those kinds of concepts. Um, extensive input from staff uh, throughout the department. We've interviewed certainly command staff, mid managers, and some mid managers were gonna be here uh, for three days next week, uh, doing ride-alongs in every, every part of the city so that we can see how it all fits together from a patrol perspective. Um, we had an employee survey that's been active recently, and a little over half of the uh, department responded to that, so a good response rate, right? and that gave us some uh, good feedback uh, on the focus of the study as well as some good ideas. So what we're here to do, so that's what we've done the last couple of months. What we're doing the next couple of months, besides having four of these meetings, this is the second one, is doing the analysis of the work, <clears throat> the workload uh, statistics that we've gotten and blending that together with our understanding of how uh, the beat system works and how the scheduling system works, uh, et cetera. So again, it's staffing and deployment, both in time and a schedule, as well as space uh, in a beat system. Let me show you why that's important, okay? This is another client, uh, San Jose, California. Uh, we worked with them a few, quite a few years ago. We're currently working with them now on the same issue. The, the picture, the, the map on the left shows what their deployment system was before we got there. And I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail as to what the colors mean. One color represents that they're up to 40% more than the average in terms of call for service, and another set of colors on the red scale is up to 40% below. The point I want you to understand is that a lot of variation in workload and a lot of variation in ability to work with the community proactively. And what we recommended was on the other side, as you can see, much more consistent abilities to handle work, uh, call for service workload, as well as to be proactive and to work with the community. And that's our goal here. It may not be as perfect as that, but uh, oh, that's our goal, is to have a... a uh, um, I want that. Hmm? I want that. You want that? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> but, you know, the, the thing is, as I mentioned, we worked with San Jose a number of years ago. It doesn't look like that now. 
because they've grown like crazy the last five years. Reno's grown like crazy for a longer period of that. It's not just grown, it's changed in terms of the number of people and the type of problems you have downtown. It's grown outwardly. Uh, so you need to do this every few years, whether or not you use a consultant, that doesn't matter. You need to look at your workload to be able to establish uh, you know, how effectively you're serving the community and how effectively officers are using their time and have time to refresh and be available for uh, the next thing or to, uh, to work with you. So what we would like to do in these community meetings is hear, uh, what I'd like to hear anyway, is your feedback on three kinds of things. Uh, how present they are, how visible they are in um, your part of the city, uh, how responsive they are to your needs, and I'll explain what I mean a little bit more in, the, in a minute, and uh, how proactive they are in problem solving. Uh, but that, again, that doesn't exclude other kinds of things that we can hear. I'm not going to structure it, so we're going to talk about 20 minutes on one thing and 20 minutes on another. I think with the, the number of people we have here, it's just going to flow on anyway. So uh, I'm going to go uh, with the flow. But what I mean with some of these things, I'm going to skip over two slides here. Uh, community presence is, um, are they visible in your area? Do you see them periodically, <clears throat> whatever neighborhood you live in? Uh, are they engaged with you or do you just see them but they don't get out of their cars? Do they, they stop and talk to you ever? Um, do they, are they present in neighborhood associations or homeowners associations or other ways, more structured kind of community event kind of ways where you get to interact with them and uh, talk to them about your, your issues? And what suggestions do you have for them to be more engaged and more present? Uh, next slide. So in responsiveness, this is obviously a really important uh, part of this study, and we've gathered a lot of information which we're analyzed right here that gets at on an emergency call, what are your expectations about how quickly they should get there? An emergency call would be something in progress. It might be a violent crime. Uh, it might be some other type of thing, but would you expect them to be there certainly no more than 10 minutes uh, or uh, you know, within a five minute period of time? If you've had a call like that, what has been your experience? On the other side of the equation, I mean, most of what police officers do are not responding to calls like that. They're responding to lower priority calls. They're responding to uh, uh, property crimes, uh, other types of crimes, things that aren't crimes, quality of life types of things, uh, nuisance types of things, and things like that. What are your expectations about how quickly they should get there for that type of thing, whether it's in progress or not? Um, uh, and what has been your experience in that? 40 minutes is a guide post that many communities use. I'd be interested in, in, um, in your thoughts about that too. Um, in Reno, um, you have civilian responders as well. Uh, police officers today in Reno, and in many communities across the country, don't just have police officers respond to calls for service. You've got what are called community services officers who respond to, uh, uh, first of all, mental health types of situations, but also uh, respond to lower priority calls, not in progress types of things. And are you open to more of that? Or what has been your experience with that? And any suggestions you've got? And then lastly, uh, proactivity. When, it, uh, when concerns about crime or quality of life issues have been brought up by you in meetings like this with the police department or in other ways, have they been responsive? Have they listened? Have they translated your input into action and there's some sort of change? Do they talk to you about the change that they made? Um, for your concerns, do you feel that they're prioritized? Um, so, and then what do you think they should do about it? So those are the kinds of things that we'd like to hear about. Um, so um, maybe before we get started, maybe we could just go around and, and hear from, I don't know what parts of the city you live in, but in your part of the city, what are your major concerns? Are they property crimes? Are they violent crimes? Are they things like catalytic converter uh, thefts? Uh, are there burglaries? What, what are your major, major concerns? And do you feel safe? So anybody feel like adding something in, in that? And maybe say what part of the city. Okay, I'll start. Okay. My name is Susan and I live in the South West. So we actually don't see police in our neighborhood very often because it's a nice neighborhood and not too much going on. 
So I did have the reason I came today is because I had a question regarding Reno Police Department's procedure. And I'm not sure if this is the time to ask on how they handle a situation. I'm not sure if I can ask that now and really tell you what sure. happened to me. And we'll see what we can do. But I would like to let you know that uh, in response to one of your questions up there about it, it was a non priority call, I called a oh. non emergency number, and I was very pleased because they did show up in 20 minutes. Okay. And I see you were saying something about 40 minutes, like yeah. satisfactory. Yeah. It seemed like a long friend. But anyway, um, so should I wait and ask the officer uh, okay. on the side, or is it okay to ask about the procedure of the police? Try it out. Let's ask the question. Well, what happened is I was leaving my house. In the morning, it's from 10 o'clock, and we have the alley that runs behind our house. There was a car park uh, by our wall, by the alley, with a broken out window in the back, and when it's all over the place, was no license plates. So we knew that I wasn't right. So we I called a non-emergency number, and the police arrived in about 20 minutes. Two officers. They went up and knocked on the car window, and it took a while, but there were two people sleeping in the car. So they rolled the window down, and the officer spoke to the person briefly, and then they left. And they didn't get an ID from these people, nor did they get an, a registration slip. And when they started to leave, I just said, excuse me, and I said, um, are you going to ask them to leave? And the officer, it was a female officer, said they have every right to be there. And they drove away and left, at least. So then I still had this car, Parked right behind my house in the alley. There's two people in it, not knowing who they were, not knowing whether the car was stolen, one of the windows had been broken out of the car. And I just wanted to ask about Reno's uh, procedure on a situation like that. Don't you want to identify the people to find out who they are before you leave them at the neighbor's, at the person's house that call? Yeah. So there's a variety of things to go into mm -hmm. playing something like that. <clears throat> there's case law that dictates when we can uh, identify somebody when they must uh, provide ID to someone. Uh -huh. If we're in the uh, process of investigating a crime, then people do have to identify themselves to the police. That doesn't necessarily mean they have to provide physical ID, but you have to give your identifiers. But again, that is if you are suspected of a crime. Not being there, there's some variables that I'm unaware of. It sounds like no crime was determined to have that occurred. So whether or not they have legal standing to, you know, demand, you know, identification from them, may or may not have been the case. Uh, we do get a lot of complaints about, you know, I see people riding around without license plates all the time. A lot of people don't know that is no longer criminal. It's a civil infraction uh, that changed a couple of legislative sessions ago. So um, now you can liaison on as a criminal citation, as a civil infraction. You know what court does that get sent to, etc. Then you get into the homelessness issue of the camping and vehicles. Homelessness is obviously a major issue mm -hmm. right now, and there's also case law about um, that they have to have uh, basic life sustaining needs met. So the argument would be that part of their shelter. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a certain amount of leeway that that we have to kind of operate within. Before we just tell someone that you have to leave, if they were legally parked somewhere, they were kind of stuck. We can talk to them and say, hey, the homeowners in the area are concerned. You know, this looks kind of hokey. It might be a better idea if you maybe go find a shade tree somewhere else and suggest it. But our our ability to make that happen via the power of the state sometimes is not solved. I just have one more question. So in the state of Nevada. Are you allowed to drive on the street with no license plates on your car? That's the way that's broken. That's the same. And lots of want to see whether or not that's a stolen car. That's, so that would be a civil infraction. A civil infraction. A stolen car is civil. No, no, not stolen. The license plates. But not have any plates on your car. Right. So, so Quite a bit of traffic. Uh, traffic is not my strong suit. Mm -hmm. I apologize, that it's just never my thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can tell you that a very large quantity of what used to be criminal traffic violations are now, in fact, civil. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's a great answer, Lieutenant. Thank you. And I hope you, you realize it's not going to be our intention to make you responsible for every call for service. Uh -huh. you're not. <laughs> As we saw it in the last three years. <laughs> thank you. Thank yes. You. I'm downtown corner first in Arlington, Arlington Towers. And the, the major 
issues uh, we're dealing with as homeowners in the downtown area right now is the sea scale violations, uh, which means uh, I live in Arlington Towers. There, uh, there's the hookah hookah bar there, the Arlington um, uh, Saloon, and the next door is Playfield 66. And uh, luckily, they don't have bands, so you know, like live music. So we, I, I don't hear them. Uh, but a lot of the places downtown. Uh, have live music that will go on until two o'clock in the morning, and they don't, um, uh, which is fine as long as they control it so that the sound doesn't come out of their building and go into any other building. But we're having a problem with that, um, and that's something a, a group of us have organized down here to work on. And, uh, work on with the, with the police department. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, the police department has patrols, and, and uh, there are certain places where they park that they're supposed to park downtown. Yes. Yeah. So listen, you know, to see what's going on. But apparently, they're kind of understaffed right now, so that's not happening. Uh, so, uh, first two, Old Southwest and uh, downtown. Any other parts of the city? Yes. Uh, uh, sir, I just wanted to give a shout out of praise to RPD because I'm a working artist, and art only became legal. Here in Reno uh, in April 2014. This is the 10th anniversary when that happened. And now it's legal according to Reno Municipal Code 5.13. And the reason for that existence, this gentleman will be talking in a minute. This is Steve White. He's the uh, winning plaintiff in the case of White versus City of Sparks. And in that case, and he'll be able to explain it better. Uh, if you're an artist, you have a right to exhibit and sell your own self-expressive art that has no utility in a public forum, like on a sidewalk, in the street, or on a public park. And before that happened, I'd have my easel set up on the street next to the vendors at Hot August Nights that are paying a whole lot of money for that. And they say, well, hey, how much do you gotta pay? I say, well, I don't have to pay anything because I'm not a commercial artist. I'm a free independent artist because I'm just showing my pictures, their mm -hmm. expressions. I work as a fast sketch artist. And even before art was legal, RPD was really good. They tried to mediate. And after art became legal, only problem that I ever found is occasionally there'd be a new crop of police officers and they might not be familiar with the landmark civil rights of artists case that this gentleman, Steve White, the winning plaintiff, will talk about. Yeah, good introduction. Well, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Steve. Before I, before I say anything, I can't hear with the door. I it's my hearing aid. So. You know, I can't really to talk to the police. You know, the single greatest tool we have is any community for bringing people together in this melting pot of humanity we call America is a fine art. Community participation in the fine arts, look at we're surrounded by the arts maker. I spent 40 years on the road, paying my way around America in an RV. When I got out of the Army in 69, I had trouble fitting in with a lot of guys these days. And I wanted to spend the rest of my life trying to bring security to the and that's why I became part of it. And in my lifetime, I've witnessed the downfall of the fine arts in our society. And the fine arts are extremely important to our society because it builds bridges of understanding between all the people that make up this melting pot. And what happened was about 40, 50 years ago was the beginning of the festival industry. When city government hand out permits to these festivals take place, the people putting on those festivals don't necessarily care or know the difference between a commercial vendor and a first amendment protecting fine arts. When they threw them all together in the commercial mix together, it didn't take very long for city governments all across America to decide that I'm no different than a commercial vendor. And they threw artists under all these commercial restrictions, licenses, and permits. And they don't allow commercial vending into public property in most cities. So they used that as an excuse to literally run artists off of public property all across America. It's going on today in cities across America. It's destroyed community funding for art programs for schools because it destroyed community participation in the fine art. It all comes down to one thing. What is the difference between a commercial vendor selling something that's subject to all kinds of licenses and permits and fees 
and an outright ban on being able to sell on public property. And me, a First Amendment protected artist, and I quote the United States Court of Appeals from the Ninth Circuit, second sentence of the ruling, we hold that an artist's sale of his original artwork constitutes speech protected by the First Amendment. The city government can have reasonable and minimal time, place, and amount of restriction on First Amendment protected speech, so they have to be equally applied to all speakers. So, my question to everybody does anybody know the difference between a commercial vendor and a First Amendment protected artist? It's real important for the chief of police to know the difference. There's two things you always need to know. It's not real complicated. And yet, because of all this misinformation that's gone out for all these years, people don't understand the basic difference. Number one, self expression. Not somebody else's artwork, your own artistic self expression. And number two, it has to meet the same standard as your spoken and written words, having no other intended purpose than to be expressed. If it's based on two standards, it's fully protected. Faith. It is well settled by the United States Supreme Court that the sale of First Amendment protected material is also protected. Now, it's interesting, I got into all of this, and all my travels, I ended up in Livingston, Colorado in 1998, doing an order show in a shopping mall across the street from a park called Lynn Park. And I challenged the creation of the company very bad. And I backed them down and we opened the city of Wilson for artists to get us all on public property. So I started a free community art show in the little park there, Clement Park. And I kept it going all summer. I had senior citizens out there. I love having the senior art show up here. But we need senior citizens out there in the park show alongside kids and family. They can make a little extra money. We did this in Colorado. I had kids, high school kids. I built up a little poet writer stage, a four by four foot stage. Right. I have to let other people talk. Thank you. I I think we just, I don't want to get it's too far off of the, it's I don't want to get far off of where we're supposed to be talking about, which is control deployment. Okay. Okay. I, we, we, got, we got the point. I'd like to dial this back, and we can talk to you about art and something like that later. I'm sure that we can have that conversation. But right now, we're going to move on to patrol deployment because otherwise, I'm not going to be able to hear from people on that topic. Okay. So I apologize for the interruption, but we I can definitely. Can, but... I, and I would love to talk to you a little bit more about it afterwards because I do know you're passionate about it, and I do see the value in having the art and understanding the differences and the nuances. But I would just like to make sure we don't get off focus. Because we only have a brief amount of time to talk about the patrol deployment side of it. I got into this because I wanted to get to our back to the children work. Well, let's okay. we'll come back to the and, art. And there's still the other one. Yes, yeah. yeah. another person from the other side. I'm going to get to talk to the clerk. My name is Natalie Taylor. I'm a city councilwoman for downtown, and I'm also a downtown resident. Residents, so when we talk about community presence, responsive to community, and the proactive uh, problem, I'm going to recognize that the city council needs to make sure that we allocate the resources for our police at the very top. That's what needs to happen. From a community member, and what I'm hearing from my my constituents, um, maybe crime has decreased downtown, but there's a perception that crime is increased. So that's a big problem that we have when we're looking at the data. The perception of what is happening downtown, people don't feel safe. Um, not so. The well, so, not all. Not all, from what I'm hearing, from, from some of the things I'm hearing, Paula, I agree. I, I feel safe too, but I'm, I'm trying to talk on behalf of the, the constituents. Um, the community presence, we would love to see more, and Chief has heard us talk about this of actual walking, um, not emergencies, and again, I know we're understaffed, so we need to commit those resources to that, but we'd like to see walking. Um, responsiveness to community, different call times, so if you call the non-emergency number, sometimes you will get somebody, sometimes you won't, you're directed through a tree, that can be very, um, I would say, Frustrating. frustrating to people sometimes and it depends on, depending on what's going on within the entire city you're waiting between 10 and 40 minutes 
a lot of times. I'm glad your response was a lot quicker. Um, and then on the proactive thing, I would just uh, leave this to Chief too. You, you they keep our teams, our our police chief and teams can't be proactive because they're so behind trying to do all the things right. that mm -hmm. there's just no way. So if we can get to proactive, we'd be I'd be super supportive of that. And anything that I can do in my role to support those efforts, I'm happy to. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I don't know who's in charge of <laughs> nobody. Because it's not me. You are. I can tell you. Why are you with me? Yes, yes. I, 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 you were here early, so you yeah, can go. I don't want to say anything. So. <laughs> First, let me introduce myself. Yeah, I'm Ambassador Victor Ho of NWCP. Ambassador. Okay, what I receive most of the time, complaint from a lot of people, and we the one dealing with They come to me and we deal with it with the various police uh, department. Mm -hmm. What I want to say is that since we have a lot of people in this room, let's keep the time. Maybe 10 minutes speech, and then answer will follow. If we don't do that, we're going to stay all day long. So that's just what I just stopped Yeah, saying. no, thank you. Exactly. Yeah, we have three days done. Bring him back. Yes. Oh, sorry. You're next. You and I. Okay, I, I live in the old Southwest. Farmer Bennett Park is, is a park I used to go to all uh, play tennis. And um, and uh, then we go um, rafting down a river with family, you know, in this use the restrooms and whatnot. And um, it's gotten to the point where there's still a lot of homeless who hang out there. And um, the, as far as I'm concerned, Will cover that part. Um, they go as far as California, I believe. Um, at any rate, they don't cover the part. And, and it, it's gotten to the point where you feel very uncomfortable being over there. Mm -hmm. I've sent pictures to the city council members on the condition of the restrooms. I mean, they're trashed. And here we are working on trying to redo the part, but yet we can't even maintain it the way it is. And um, when we have a lot of events going on downtown, we used to walk all over. And now later, like we walk to the Pioneer or something and come home, but now we don't, we drive. Um, but the point is, um, when people come, I mean, we have a beautiful river. I mean, it's just gorgeous around there. And um, people make comments about, Wow, I've never realized how bad it is in here. And, and there were different incidents that have occurred to people where they go, oh my goodness. And mentally ill individuals who are acting out and um, people say, I'm never coming here again. And so downtown has gotten got a bad rap. And yeah, the ambassadors are cleaning up the crap off the streets and everything, but I don't know what the answer is. Um, we have to take a, a stand really on getting people to the right areas and keeping them out of these areas where they they threaten people. I mean, it's a presence that is very uncomfortable for a lot of people. And um, I'm concerned because it's changed. It's, it's Reno's reputation. And um, it's, it's not very encouraging. Have you had the opportunity to express those concerns? I have all the time. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. And the local black bear population likes our river too. Mm -hmm. yeah. I got a question and a couple of comments. <laughs> when license plates aren't on a car and that's a civil issue, does that mean there aren't tickets written for it? Can be. If they're not typically on the street. Uh, typically you will see civil uh, infractions accompany uh, criminal charges. Unless it is uh, done by say the you know, a motor unit or a traffic unit, well, that's that's their sole function is traffic. Uh, but as far as, a, you know, if a patrol officer is riding around, the chances are they're probably going to a call for service. And if they do right. run across them, you typically see civil infractions only accompanied when there are other criminal charges as well. It's not to say that you can't. That's just uh, one thing I've learned over my lifetime. I've learned a lot of things. Um, did you retain them? Laws and ordinances and speed limits become irrelevant when there's no enforcement. And uh, Veterans Parkway is a perfect example. 
when I first moved here, regularly you'd see motor cops out there running radar. In the last three years, I've seen it one time. That doesn't mean there haven't been more, but the average speed on that road is 65, 70 miles an hour. If you're doing 60 miles an hour, you're getting uh, flashing headlights and flipped off and people throwing crap at you. Um, I live in Southeast Reno, and I think the Reno PD does a, a better than admirable job with the resources that you have, and that's the problem. And as we increase uh, police, which we have to do, uh, where's the money to pay for it going to come? Mm -hmm. And my vote is tax the businesses and the developers and make them pay for it, not the residents through their property taxes. But that's a different right for a different day. Uh, you know, th this city is out of control. I'm glad there's somebody from the city council here, but the growth that's going on here uh, is beyond ridiculous. We live in a desert. We got no water. We don't have a lot of water, I should say. We do have water, but not a lot of water. They're forecasting 100,000 people in this area, Washoe County, over the next 10 years. Yeah. Addition. Addition. Right. We're going to get the water for that. Not to mention the, all that's going on on American Parkway, the server farms that are being built out there, guess what they use to cool their machines? Water. The Indians are suing the, uh, everybody again because not enough water is getting Pyramid Lake. If they win that and more water gets diverted, that's less water for Sparks and Reno. Um, you know, Daybreak Park, uh, Daybreak Development started out 4,400 units. And when the city council correctly voted it down because it's in a floodplain, right they, they sued right and right. won. And it got uh, reduced to 3,800, right. but the fire and the police station was supposed to go in there, got dropped, and nobody talked about that. Um, it, we got an ethics problem here with the de developers. They, they are able to donate money to elected officials, uh, which amounts to a bribe, and it's legal in the back. <laughs> it's a little scheduling problem. So, so they could. But what, what are we going to do when we get these extra 100,000 people here and we don't have enough fire department and police and public services to deal with the people that we got? And we're approving developments every time they come on. And, you know, it's, it, I've only lived here five years and I tell you, it makes me want to think about moving. Our so, model is build it, they will come. Can I, can I call time out here for a little bit? Mm -hmm. So, we're, there are a lot of problems that Reno has that every community across the country has, and we're not going to solve them all here, they're, in spite of the fact that they're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. But we're here to find out about your experience working with the police department in the recent past and what kind of things they need to focus on in the future. So again, I, I'd like to hear about your experience about how visible they are in your neighborhood. When you call them, or do they meet your expectations about how quickly you should get there given the urgency of the call. And if you've had the opportunity to work with them in neighborhood watch groups or something like that, do they listen to you and they respond to what your needs are? That, that's Because that's what we're here to do is to work with them on best using the resources they have uh, and make an argument to the council and to the community if that's what the analysis shows that they need more. Yes. <laughs> okay, so... Um, yeah, I am just curious about the funding and everything like that. I think the Reno, Reno police officers are great. I have a lot of great relationships with them. Um, I come from an asset protection background, and I'm asset protection right now at a retailer um, in the near the Metalwood Mall area. And um, I would just say that a lot of times I know that we're short staffed, and so uh, not. Uh, Reno PD is short staffed and the guys are great with doing what they can um, but the funding is just like crucial because of the response time sometimes isn't the greatest but that's fine I like I take it into consideration like it's okay I'll handle it myself and then I'll call for an attempt to locate on them instead if they leave so um, 
just being able to get more reach, more police officers, which obviously is more funding, and then being able to stretch that into the detectives division because of the fact that even though they'll take our cases, um, it is our cases will be immediately closed after that. And then we got to call back and, and try to keep following up. And, you know, like one of the cases was a big deal, like a guy spit in my face and pulled a gun on me. So it was like, yeah, I want to bet that was immediately closed out. And it wasn't the lack of the officer who was trying. So I don't have any complaints on the patrol officers. It's just that we funding for the patrol officers and detective division um, for the detectives to be able to work their cases as well. Um, Can I ask a follow-up? So yes. have there been instances, some of the examples that you've mentioned, clearly you have called the police department mm -hmm. on some of those, but it, you, I think you said that there were times that you didn't call them. Right. Right? Were, were there times that you felt like you should have called them, but for some reason you had low expectations that they could get there in a the time that you needed or something like that? I wouldn't say it's low expectations. Okay. There's plenty of times where I could, should have called them that I didn't, but it wasn't low expectations. It's just that I knew that they're stretched thin. Okay. And that's why. Okay. And that they really, they really do try, but they are stretched so thin that I just try to only call them on the really serious stuff. Okay. Can you waiting a long time. Yes, sorry. Oh, yeah. So can we rotate like this side, this side, okay. zoom, this side, this side, zoom? Not the average. Good idea. This, side for... <laughs> this one's been very patient. Not it. Thank you. No. Um, I, I came from another community, another state, and I found the, the police response to be excellent. What I was particularly interested in is how they handled mentally ill and confused people. The patience was extraordinary um, because I know how hard that can be. Their response has been great. And I think what we need to remember is we don't always know the full story when they respond. Uh, you know, just like the situation, they may have known those people in that club. It's possible. And the, the second thing is, I think you need, if you would, tell us what we can do to help you. Because it's a two-way street. But that's it. <laughs> Does the police department have community meetings where they do that? We do. Um, and we, we've been pretty vocal with people that um, both like in, in your situation where maybe you don't call because you don't feel that it's a necessary thing at that time. Um, some other issues that we have with people calling, but callback numbers or allowing us the ability to and reach back out to them. Um, it is kind of, um, and I think it's more, I see it here more, it's more prevalent here that people are hesitant for some reason to provide their name and call back number when an incident happens or sometimes even to report crime. And I, I don't know exactly why. So part of that education piece that we do when we're talking to people is how important it is for us to have the data and the information especially in studies like this, we're pulling tons of data out to say, where are our calls being generated from? Who's calling when? Not specific person, yeah. but what areas do we need to respond to? And if um, we don't have that data to work with, it gives us a false sense of understanding of what the actual problem is. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we do talk a lot about is, is the importance of reporting things so that we can pull that back out to under have a better understanding of it. <laughs> Online question? Oh, that's oh, back. Yes, yes. yes. My name is Donna Terry. I am a resident. I live at the end of Davidson Road. It's a lot so far. It used to be my grandmother's backyard. Um, for years, school buses came. They brought kids to look in the park. It's about 14 acres. Yep. The only reason that I have a road in the middle of my property is the city took that to be the entrance area. It's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. The homeless love the river. You know, they can. Uh, and I'm the crazy lady that lives at the end of the road at this point. This car's completely concerned. But I, I live there. I'm like the last human being of the nature. And it's it's gotten to the point where I guess at one point the school buses didn't come anymore because they were afraid it wasn't safe. And the, the Department of, of Wildlife used to have a full time person in that big yard that's there. Mm -hmm. And I was told by one of the mechanics for the park 
that the woman that used to be the, the ranger uh, was molested there, and it was never really brought up to the community, and the woman was never replaced in the position. So all these years, there's never been someone there at the same time. And I worry, um, I get told a lot of awful things by those people, you know, yelling and screaming, pulling their pants down, and talking to Jesus Christ at three o'clock in the morning. I um, am just like you. I want to know why the parks, if, if they can't take care of it between the city and the Department of Wildlife, Department of Fish and Game, Green and Red, then shut it down. But um, it's wild in there. And it's wild for a reason. The coyotes and the mountain lions and the deer and the beaver and the osprey and the otters, all those guys live in there. And that was the point. They were going to be secure. <laughs> now, tickers are being all around. I literally have property on both sides of the entrance so that I got two. So there's a road right down the middle. And they can't fence. I I I have my area fenced and I have no trespassing sign. Um, but I get told by people a lot of very, I'm not going to say it here, uh, mm -hmm. things that um, make me feel terrible. I have called. At one point, um, the orchid was so full of crap and, and horrible things like uh, meth needles and all that. And called, and, and there were people there that we were trying to get them to move their stuff. I called the police, and I got told them. I'm down the street, I can see. <laughs> I didn't and there, way down I was 40 or what's now called Horseshoe, there was a policeman in a car that basically, um, there's nothing I can do. And I'm hoping that this new law, this new thing about 100, 100 feet from the river and 100 feet from a park can help, really help. So we can give them some tea because I feel their frustration. They're like, there's nothing we can do. And it's uh, it's uh, very frightening, especially at night. Okay. Um, Mel asked, do you want to try to unmute and ask your question, or I can just read it, whatever you prefer. Yeah, sure. Hi, thanks for having this meeting. Um, so former traveler, travel nurse turned local, love the city, live right across from Idlewild Park. Been there off and on for about five years, and lots of um, bands that people are living in, oops, excuse me, that people are living in, and they just simply move around the park. Um, also, a lot of homeless sleeping under the influence. When am I supposed to call? Like, I guess, I guess I'm. I just need clarity on that because it seems normal um, in terms of police presence. Might see them drive by. Never seen them stop anyone in the park. There's no foot patrol. There's no bike patrol here. I see that clearly. Um, so I drive an hour away to get to to get to somewhere nice that I feel safe, which is pretty frustrating. Um, so that's the first question. And the second question is, I'm from a stand your ground state, um, Florida. And I guess in terms of response time for violence crimes, like what are my rights? Um, so then I could expect like from you versus our criminals protected here, like neighboring states. So just wanted to gather some information on that. I can't tell. Uh, so, as far as as what your rights are and stand your ground, that we're really not in a position where giving legal advice is, is advised for a plethora of reasons that I'm sure we can all um, understand. However, you know, as far as okay. the question, I can go more into when you should call, you know, the police and what the different reporting mechanisms. And I think that the the important thing to understand is if there's something that's in progress or a crime or you feel unsafe, those are times when you can call 911. I never, I never will discourage somebody from calling the police. You might be directed to a different resource, but it doesn't hurt to call and say, this is what's happening. Other times people feel that they're in a, a space that they're not feeling safe, but they're really not sure what to do. And we can't either respond or help direct you or whatever else might happen with that. So we never discourage the calling. Um, if you're seeing something like blight or kind of ongoing issues where you're not feeling threatened and it's not an ongoing crime, those are better reported through Reno Direct. Right. Because a lot of those things are not necessarily police department responses to. It can be park rangers that can respond to that. It can be code enforcement. It can be clean and safe. It can be public works. 
So it allows us to better track those. Um, and our response time in the department is for majority of, of issues. So traffic regulations, mentioned veterans highway, uh, things like that. Especially the traffic issues, we're looking at about a they can about a uh, with 48 hour response to. So if you were to call and report a traffic issue, say in Veterans Parkway or speeders along a certain area or a school district grounds, um, our traffic units out there within 48 hours or at the next appropriate time for it to, so if you say it is happening during school hours, I'm not gonna send somebody out on a Saturday, obviously, um, but to go out and check that response and then we track it and we'll send a response back. So that's how we kind of handle some of those if it's not happening right there. It's hard to report an immediate speeding, right? You can't call and say, hey, this guy's in front of me speeding right now. It, it's not really something you do, but if you have an ongoing problem with speeding in your neighborhood, as an example, reporting that in our traffic units will be out there within 48 hours to do the additional enforcement. Is that kind of my direction? If it's in progress and okay. you call the police. If it's something that's ongoing, be responded to the next day or the following day because it's like a fly tissue or something like that. Reno Direct is probably the best mechanism because then we have that tracking and we have the appropriate response by the appropriate team. Okay. And sometimes it's a whole multiple yeah. response, right? And those Reno Direct cases and are so for the okay. And so for the ongoing homeless issue in the park. Um, where they're just in general acting erratic, is that just normal and accepted? I mean, well, is so that, that when do I? I mean, it's kind of just known. Again, let's so, And then sometimes, you know, I mean, it's. I I understand exactly what you're saying, and it's a really fine line of when you call and report things and when you don't. And I and I think that the what we have to remember, regardless of all of our beliefs and thoughts on things. Um, you know, home, being homeless is not a crime. There is crimes associated that we associate um, more right. closely with people who are homeless. Things yep. like camping in the park, that's not allowed. There's ways that we can prevent that and respond to it if we know that the certain parks are issues. Um, somebody having erratic behavior isn't always something that's criminal. Sometimes it's something that we can't enforce because it doesn't right. have a nexus to an okay. enforcement side of it. But that's where it comes from that if okay. I don't expect anybody in this room to make that decision on when that is what, if that's really for us to kind of, to respond to and then engage and figure out what the next steps are. I will say that the city has a very robust um, program for dealing with homeless people and especially for trying to provide services, get them into different programs, um, centers, whatever it is before, especially if we're not able to do enforcement, either there's not laws that allow for it or they haven't committed a crime that allows for it in that space. Um, so it's a total approach, which is why if you're see, experiencing a problem with homelessness in a park near you, that the proper response would probably be Reno Direct first, unless you are feeling that you are victimized by something or there's something that's an immediate threat to you or somebody else, that would be a police response. And, and mental health resources. Yes, yeah, so a lot of mental health resources. We have most clinicians. Uh, there's uh, a lot of things that go into that response, but the bottom line is if everybody becomes treating this like it's just the normal to have that in your park and there's not that response, and I understand the frustration behind it, we don't know where it's happening and when to respond to it. Which is kind of where the ambassador's part of it comes from. And then, a lot of are you? Okay, uh, yes. This side? Uh, my name is Julie and I live in the city on the Southwest. And um, we don't really ever see a police presence, which until last week was not an issue. And we have, uh, have been the victim of a TikTok door challenge. And um, we decided uh, not to call the non emergency number because we thought, well, you know, after five or seven minutes, the kids, the group of kids moved on. And we didn't, we thought, we, you know, this department would be busy with other things. But we did go down and filed a police report and uploaded photos. And I have to say, the staff, the front office staff at Second Street, awesome. They were just so helpful. And I was wondering, does the police currently patrol, especially I think in Swope Middle School, the immediate area, 
at the end of the school day or are there plans for that? Um, I can answer a lot of the school district patrolling because the school district police, their school district police, they're responsible for the kids to and from school. So when we do get complaints about traffic issues and kids walking to and from school, we do refer them usually over to the school district police for handling. So we can be out there at that time, but a lot of times we would refer you back to the school district to have them kind of make that response. Okay, so should the school district uh, officers patrol or? We'll see them in those areas, especially as kids are walking to and from school to make sure that they're getting there safely, but we can do additional resources too and augment with them if they need help. Okay. So we kind of work together. And, and that's the importance of calling it in. So yeah. That both of them can work together. If we don't know that there's a, like, there's a lot of schools in town that kids can go freely and there's no issues. They're going to create a problem. So if we aren't aware that there's a problem in the neighborhood because of them leaving school and, and we don't know about it, that's how we have to know to respond. Um, and if we get the response through Reno Direct, we'll coordinate our response with Washoe County because the school district really is the appropriate responding agency for that. But we do help them out because we know that there, there's a lot of schools and not as many officers. So we do help them out. Thank you, Chief. Of course, absolutely. Yeah, since the very beginning of the boundary. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Neil McGarden, Executive Director of Downtown Reno Partnership and the ambassadors that oversee 1,500 properties and 110 block area of downtown in the business improvement district of downtown Reno. Um, our experience with Reno Police Department is um, daily, sometimes hourly. Uh, our experience has been that when we have an emergency call, the response is fantastic. It is all hands and, and they are there in the situation where we think that can be benefit to your resource allocation and to dealing with what we will call repeat offenders doing the same behaviors that there is either an RMC or a law that doesn't allow it, is to have more persistent and consistent police application of those rules, particularly on foot. Because what we see is the non-emergency calls for the, the fire camp next to the river or the individual that is sleeping or lying on the sidewalks that isn't supposed to be or the person that is uh, doing the things that all the rules are on the books is our people will get called as a non-emergency. Oftentimes it falls in the food chain of more important things. By the time it gets addressed, that individual has moved to a different location, um, but the behavior hasn't changed. And once we do get RPD's resources that are available to come and show up, it gets just shifted a little bit and it's, okay, Sam, you can't be doing that. You got to move along. Sam's behavior doesn't change because there's really not a consequence. There's not a consistent consequence to that repetitive behavior. So Sam is the one that we encounter 17 times a day. So I think if there's more foot patrol, which is largely not existent right now in downtown because the resources are so strained and they're running call to call. I think that would be a tremendous improvement over what we are experiencing right now in the downtown. Our ambassadors are out there dealing with it 24-7 and they are in it. And they are they have they're resolving as much as they can, but they also know police are coming through. They're they're, they're not always there to have a consistent consequence for that behavior. So it just shifts from that part of the river to that part of the river. And, then, and because there's not a, a constant consequence to that behavior for that individual's actions. So you're, you're saying that a walking beat or bikes or something like yeah. that would have that kind of presence so it's not just moving. Because we see it. We see when yeah. we uh, do a history walk with RPD, we will see the behavior change. And then as soon as RPD is kind of gone or they've gone to somewhere else, we'll see that behavior come back. And it's not just being present, it's a consequence for a repetitive and not allowed behavior. Um, so, and again, downtown Reno, I, one of my big curiosities is in other cities where there is a visitor core, we are a huge visitor town, we have 10 times the entire population of Reno that visits downtown Reno on an annual basis. What is that blend of deployment? Uh, between foot, bike, and vehicle, you know, what does that look like in a make the large size with the mix of anything? Uh, it depends, it varies quite a bit, but there is that black, and I think you're right. I think it doesn't exist right now. We're trying to see if it goes right. Yes, but always professional, the police department, uh, when they respond to the incidents, always very professional. We're just seeing a ratcheting of the behaviors. Uh, 
Somebody has to keep track of it. I know, thank yeah. you, Chris. I have to be honest. Good. Um, Barbara provided a comment in the chat. I just wanted to give her an opportunity to speak if she would like to. If not, we'll um, give the comments in paper as well. Or Barbara, did you want to add anything? Oh, you're muted. Hold on. Hold on, we can't hear Barbara, do you want to try to speak? Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. I, I'm fine with it. I just wrote out my thoughts um, in the chat. But as I said, basically, I'm a 56-year Reno resident, and I've seen a lot of changes. Um, to the point when I arrived, I was told people don't even lock their doors in Reno. When I worked downtown, went to the university, and <laughs> things have changed. But I, what I really miss is I've lived in Northwest Reno all around the university while attending, and then now downtown for the last nine years at the Palladio, is I miss the police presence. They were always like in the coffee shops, having lunch or breakfast or riding their bikes through downtown or at events, you'd always see them. And it was such a good feeling. And I realize, you know, the shortfall since 2020, but that, to me, I, I pay for the ambassadors and I appreciate them, <clears throat> but I, I want to see the physical presence of my Reno police force. Our business, my family's business is downtown for 74 years on East 4th Street. The first one up. I start by commending the Reno Police Department and everything we're going. I attended several meetings with Chief Nance. I want to echo Councilwoman's comments, Naomi's comments. Um, one of one of the things that I think we definitely want foot patrols. We're encountering people on a daily basis. Uh, I'm going to bring up some gentlemen. Said, "How can we help?" Or a woman said, "How can we help?" Well, I put together a business group that covers the East Forest Street from Wells Avenue all the way down to Galetti, and that has been tremendously successful working as a team. So all of us businesses are on the same page. And like with anything that you do, um, I wish people would attend every single meeting that I put up. They just don't. But I try to keep them informed as possible, and it has made a gigantic difference. I first thought we were here because you're going to need people to help you move and then be in uh, my business group corridor, but the foot patrols, exactly what they almost said, we're, we're in a place that's doing all they can with people, with the opening of CARES campus soon, and um, we're direct engagement that you have going on chief match with officers being trained and social workers with them is going to uh, certainly, I think, be a game changer down the road. So I, we appreciate that a lot. And we know that everything doesn't happen overnight. Um, it's the railroad is another thing that I'm working on. Um, in fact, they're sweeping it right now, but uh, trying to get to Amadei. If anybody in this group can help us with that, we need to re really need the, the railroad to come to this table and be a part of this. Um, because that's where the root of the majority of this starts. Um, and so if you could reach out to them, that'd be great. Um, I'm very hopeful. Our response times have been impeccable. Dealing with all the officers has been overly pleasurable experience in some really difficult things that go on downtown. Um, I, I commend you on doing a study because I, I it's I think what everybody think you know maybe resources are being used in too many in other areas but I do encourage everybody in your team to really use Reno Direct because the more data that really can be collected and where the hot spots are what we call heat spots hot spots where it really helps um, so with your data collection and those what types of things are going on is huge uh, but. We're with you. 
Um, and I think as community, we can bring this to uh, make it even better. And just to note, um, when we're talking about data, at the height of COVID, there were 2,200 people around our business, sleeping, camping. We have seen some horrific things happen when people run over the railroad right. My employees are out there, our employees, and those are things that just shouldn't happen. And so 46 plus percent of those people have been placed. So it's important to note also that everything the city of Reno is trying to do, the Reno Police Department, the Sheriff's Office had an ordinance that just passed, um, or we're trying to move down the right, right road. And, and uh, as a business, and I also live in the old Southwest, uh, it's, it's working, we've got to keep it going. Okay. If I can, real quick, and Eric, I appreciate your your kind um, words and and really the partnership that we have. And to Naoma too, when we're talking about, um, and you know, Councilmember Taylor probably knows this better than anybody. When if I don't know something's a problem, I can't fix it. Right. So if you know, we've had highs and lows. We've had yeah. a response that was less than impeccable that shouldn't have yeah. happened the way that it happened. But that's an opportunity for me to take that information and go to that officer and say, this is the law. This is what you can do. Mm -hmm. Do that education piece. And this is actually what we expect from you. And it's not about getting somebody in trouble or, or making them feel bad about themselves. It's an education that we do when I have the information. So Eric, you've given me great yeah, feedback it, when somebody didn't do something well. Yeah. And I can fix it then. Well, and when I started in chief, I told just to remind for the group, I didn't even heard this, but when I was threatened by a knife and somebody tried to stab me in my own office building, um, I can sit and bitch and read a direct and do all that all day long. I need to know who are these people? What's going on? We need to understand that. And that's what we try to, I try to help educate the group and, and it works. It works. And so, it's, and it's going to work because we're not. We're it's figuring out how to open that dialogue and communication. So I know when something's not going yeah. well, so I can adjust. But if everybody just sits back and says, complains on their own right or doesn't tell me, then we can't fix it. And so I've done a lot of work with both of these groups. And I think that the, the turning point for a lot of that is that honesty and that ability to be open about when something doesn't go well. So if you had called the police the night that you had the incident in your house and you didn't like that response because it didn't work for you, I need to know that so we can adjust how we're responding, which is why these community meetings are so important. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Quick yes, okay. reiteration of what has been mentioned before, lack of foot control. When I first moved into the Flavio, first in Sierra in 2007, there was an auxiliary police station in Boutique. And so foot control walk, worked out of there. And so that station is still empty, it's been empty for years, and I don't know. But there maybe once in a while you had people present there, but we need to get more of a control. Thank you. Thank you. Now, when I'm Zoom, so we're back to that okay. But he had said, I understand it is for I. Hello. Uh, my name is Eric Rood. Uh, I live in downtown Reno also. I live in the Montage. Thank you, Chief Man, for being here and communicating with this thing, this opportunity. I want to add all everything that Kathy, uh, the Councilwoman Taylor said, Jim, you know, about the model of down in the flash as well. Uh, uh, you know, there's people in our building who feel very safe downtown, but there's people who don't, and there's people who don't live downtown who don't come back because of the perception of lack of safety. So I know there's an effort we're looking at, you know, how to be more present, and we're looking at more police foot patrol. Um, I want to also, you know, daytime hours, evening hours are great because more presence, I think, than more. People are more comfortable coming around downtown. There'll be more businesses that open down here. There'll be more visitors should go to those businesses. And we're having so many. You need to understand how many residents are living in downtown. And the number of residents is going to double in the yeah. next like five years. You can see how this building's going. Yeah. So there's more and more residents. Yeah. Um, and with some more police presence, I think it's just going to all get better. Want to focus on the, the, the midnight to 5 a.m. time that we're very not doing that too much. Um, but uh, but there's a lot of unruly activity. Sometimes it's violent. Sometimes it's shootings. Don't 
times uh, was a uh, you know, criminal activity that happens, more than just disturbances of peace. And there was something called a bar car that was a uh, car that was staffed by police and code enforcement. And uh, they would be just making sure the bars were keeping track of their uh, their patrons who were coming in and out. And, um, and what I found, I looked down on some bars, I noticed that when there's a police car, <coughs> police car park on West 2nd Street or in the alley between a couple of nightclubs, that everybody's on their better behavior. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, the are a little bit better, but the fire is there exiting bars and going to the next bar. There's less cars screeching up and down West Second Street or motorcycles revving their engines on, you know, going by First Street on uh, uh, Sierra Street, going by the Palladio or by all the towers. So if in terms of trying to increase presence, uh, it would be great if, if that could be some of the focus where we could have a car just just parked for five minutes, ten minutes. It's amazing every you know so often rotating around. Um, that would be very helpful. Um, and we have trained, we have talked to our residents and all the downtown residents because we all work together to call me on the rent and give you data. So we will continue to tell everybody to keep reporting so that real police, you have the data. We're looking forward to your presentation next Wednesday. Me too. We're going to share some data and uh, talk a little bit more about the organization. So this is a really quick time uh, at downtown Reno. We have a relatively new team who's come in here eager to learn about how this city operates. We now have a consultant who's working with the RPD. Uh, we've got more residents coming downtown, more visitors. We're going into the event season. Here we go. Maybe this gonna, winter's going to stop. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's just an exciting time to be, be exploring how are we going to be doing more with what well, limited research we have? I understand that, but but they, uh, but we appreciate it. So keep up the good work because Reno you know, is much safer. It's really I I, I live downtown. I walk. I run downtown. Um, I'm on the streets all the time. That's but but there is no perception with so many many right. uh, on downtown. It's too sketchy. And, and if they don't come downtown, they're not going to bring their business downtown. Our businesses that have opened up that have will not survive, and it's just going to get it. That will be so. No, you're absolutely right, and it gets at the visibility. I mean, I, I've been working for Reno and other issues for over 20 years, and nobody lived downtown 20 years ago. Okay. Now there's a lot of people living there, and there's going to be even more. And uh, perceptions of safety are critical to achieving that, and it has an economic development and other kinds of development uh, things as well. And we've heard in this meeting and the other meeting we had uh, last weekend that some people, some of the time, especially at night, don't feel safe. And so um, you're right, visibility has a real impact on that. People's behavior change when they see uh, a police officer, whether they're driving or doing something on the street. And uh, that's why we need to focus on uh, patrol, having enough resources in the right parts of, that have enough resources citywide but especially where there are risks and real problems that they're visible to have an impact on that. A lot of people come together. Yeah. I think oh, that's sure. one little thing that you said. Next week at council, I I think if I um I, I can't I always say this isn't the place for me to tell you everything that we're doing. It's really an opportunity for you to tell us, but you are right. Next week at council, we're doing a presentation on what we've done downtown and the changes we've made and some of the upcoming things. So anybody that's interested in hearing about that, please, please log in and watch or come back and watch it later. So so can I ask a question? Because I've heard about a couple of large-scale meetings, like a budgetary kind of meeting or citywide meeting in council. And I've heard about things like this group and maybe the business improvement district. But what happens in neighborhoods in terms of uh, outside of downtown, for example, in terms of listening to uh, problems that people have and giving people a voice to express those and get some feedback from the police department? So a couple of things. Um, one is that we are always looking for opportunities to be in different neighborhoods and have community meetings. Uh, with groups that request it and so it's usually done by request or a problem that we've identified but we are symposiums there 
We have a lot of opportunities for communities to come together. If we're looking for something in a smaller group, one of the things that um, we're looking at starting probably around this summer, um, it's, it's on the list of things to do, which that list is ever growing, is to start doing community meetings in different neighborhoods. I've done several downtown. I've done um, some coffee with the cops and did the symposium. And really, the next step is to, to take that kind of show on the road, for lack of a better term, and move to different experts within those areas. Another opportunity that everybody has is through the NAPs, the neighborhood advisory boards. We the police speak at those uh, quarterly. And so there's always that opportunity to get some data and information from those, that space. And then really the opportunity just to reach out. So I've done individual meetings with people at like Paradise Park where they've experienced uh, issues over there and then some ongoing uh, different engagement activities there. It's really done by the desire um, I think it's improper for me to go into a neighborhood and say, you need more contact with the police. You need to hear from the police chief because that's kind of arrogant. I don't know what that, that community needs. But when those communities reach out and say, that's what we need, that's when we provide those services. So I, um, I think that it's really incumbent on the communities to drive that response from the police department as best as we can. Outside of downtown, has anybody been involved in those kind of things? Especially, it seems like a lot of you have been here for a long period of time. That those kinds of avenues for discussion uh, happened before, but less so now. Any feedback from outside of downtown? Um, I live in Southeast uh, Reno, and there's no neighborhood watch or anything like that anymore, and there's no communication about it. So that's something that I would definitely enjoy listening and hearing about for sure. It's interesting that you bring up neighborhood watch because I've been approached a few times recently about that. And I don't disagree with you that they're very valuable tools. We saw after, um, you know, probably a little bit of the demise of this before COVID, but definitely when COVID hit, people just stopped. And now with green cameras and doorbell cameras and next door and those types of apps, um, it's like they've taken that as a better resource than a neighborhood watch meeting. Mm -hmm. I disagree wholeheartedly with that approach, but I'm not, again, I'm not one to walk into your community and say, you need a neighborhood watch. Those have to be driven by the community members. And so the, that group that wants those things, those are services that we can help you with and provide and be present, but it has to be the community that drives them, not the general police. And that's how that works back and forth. And, and the impact of like next door and apps like that, right? Did you, yeah. did you say next door? Yeah. That's a good resource. It is. And it's taken the place for a lot of time. Yeah. But just coming from the North Valleys, um, I've worked, I've been in Ray about 20 years. I've worked downtown, I've worked in this town. Um, we had a neighborhood watch, I think, mean, you know, probably right before COVID when a city council member was running and it was great because a bunch of us got together and then nothing happened after that. <laughs> So um, and I serve on Washington County Sheriff's Office, so I mean, I'm a part of the I'm right here, but I think definitely in outlining areas, I feel like we don't know where to go sometimes or who can help us. Yeah. Or my, talk to my neighbors who don't know, there's a service that's provided because we live a little farther out. So I just think, um, and the speaker of on the Road, I take my life in my hands. <laughs> So we know to read, report it, and you will have police resources out there. That's what. And then it's like I haven't seen anybody in a couple years. That that's what happens is if people are out there for a while, problems slow down. They go somewhere else for enforcement, and we need to know when it picks back up so you can report. I will report that. Absolutely, thank you. But I feel like I'm in a very safe community where I live. Top of military, New York construction, very safe. I feel safe. I can leave my door locked. Be fine. But you know that's. Not and I, I do think that the neighborhoods that want to engage in that neighborhood watch group, it's something that we can help facilitate and be there present for you, but it is driven by the community. They have to want to be in that space to have that together. Is there a neighborhood watch app? Uh, the there is not an app. Usually what happens is, no, we don't drive those meetings. We're not the ones that are going to facilitate them and come into your neighborhood and say, start a neighborhood watch. It's a group of residents that have talked to each other that decide that they want that, that reach out to us and then we'll provide that service. But it has to come from the community first. We don't right. model for that, so it's Sure, otherwise you're not gonna know what your needs are. Yes. Hello, uh, Don Galmore, senior here, uh, 34 years up in Northwest, but I uh, basically have a, um, I'm a cop kid. My wife is, uh, my mom was the first black police woman in the state of Wisconsin, the city of Milwaukee. So I know pretty much what needs to be done. 
and um, you got home with the Glen City uh, Center um, report, right? Mm -hmm. So that you use part of that as the uh, community resource. Um, that's what we're here for, for scheduling and how to deploy. Uh, all of this can be alleviated by having community police crew. Uh, you've got your own beat that uh, that San Jose. I'm sure that that was part of uh, the uh, resolution or the, the conclusion, or at least having it be a success, is that more police were deployed locally on the foot patrol, like everybody's talking about. Yeah. But I'm talking about the neighborhood. You heard a couple of people who live on the uh, uh, outskirts, southeast, things like that, that don't see the police, but um, they should be in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're talking, going, having the same police officer in the same neighborhood, going to the same doors, you know, every day, what, twice, a, twice a week, twice a month even. But just have that face to the name and uh, all of, uh, a lot of this will be alleviated because they'll have a, a, a you know, they'll have someone that they know. I think they're familiar with it, I'm sure. I've talked to uh, Chief Nance about it when we first met her. <laughs> Seems like a long time ago. It's only been by uh, nine, eight months, maybe. It's been a year and a month. It does seem like a long time. <laughs> time. But um, and we just had a, a meeting with the uh, police this morning, and I reiterated that community policing is what we've been geared with for a long time. We're the country's top 21st century police community uh, task force um, cities in, the, in America. They're looking at what we're doing because we've been a success. We've uh, maintained the low um, criminal uh, activity record. And uh, the only thing is I've been begging for decades now for OIS, OIS information, making sure we keep that uh, current um, annually. But uh, the other thing is, uh, is that um, we've been talking about the, uh, the need for presence. Uh, during, if you've ever been to police training, there are generally about three things the police are looking for in the BBC, but the presence in traffic presence. And that's where, uh, when they mentioned that putting a car in a, on the street or in the parking lot, I can see that being a deterrent uh, tremendously. Mm -hmm. Or you just have a car sitting there and people just have second thoughts, yeah. whatever. Otherwise, our PD is, is one of the best in the country. And that's because we made sure that, and that this is the NACP, my wife had just left. And uh, that's one of the main things that we've always been noticed for because, of course, in uh, underserved communities, the police presence is almost overwhelming. Every morning, every night, that's all they think about. And, uh, you know, that's something that's oppressive. And people have to understand that when they're talking about root causes, what causes of everything that's going on. Right. So a couple of things that you said, uh, obviously presence is important. And that's one of the reasons for the studies that you need the right number of people in the right places in general to be able to achieve that. But you also talked about community policing and the need to have that responsibility and accountability for geography. And uh, you know that's important too. And that's where this redistricting study as well as the staffing study uh, really is going to be important because right now, um, we know, and probably most other urban police departments around the country, we worked with Milwaukee before, uh, it's a shell game. You know, you're down so many positions, you're just sort of putting your finger in the, in the dike to where the problem is. And uh, that's not a way to be a proactive, community-oriented police force. Community uh, police will, uh, will alleviate that, though. It will. Because when you so, have a police officer who's responsible and accountable for his own, his or her own territory. Yeah. They're going to be more inclined to take that responsibility seriously, yeah. stay on the porch longer because they've developed relationships and they know the job. 
there are police departments that have a philosophy that they designate specific officers as community liaison. Milwaukee's one of these. And, 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 and well, that's important. That's important because there are broader kind of concerns, things that take four or eight hours to deal with. But community police has got to be everybody's responsibility. So that, that's hopefully. the other, the third side of the coin yeah. is that the community uh, does have to take, and the Gwen Center, we presented that in our report. But the community has to take some responsibility Absolutely. in their own care. And that's what, we, what the lady here was talking about, is that you tell those people to screw themselves and you this is you pay taxes at your property too. Mm -hmm. But it gets to be concerning when the cumulative effect of this time in dealing with this level of enforcement capability is that people are not calling the police on important issues. Well, it should be. Yeah. And that's where it, and it's, it's, it's a tracking issue, as the chief mentioned, but it's also being able to deal with small issues. Yeah. Right. Teaching these the people, the community, that they do uh, have their, you know, their capability of getting a hold of the police mm -hmm. and utilizing their services for not just police work, yeah. not just investigatory work, but other kinds of work too. I'm going to challenge the community policing conversation. I, I think it's very important that it's how um, we develop relationships and things like that. And I think why this study becomes even more important when you factor that side of it in there is do the officers have the time to actually be in those neighborhoods and make those relationships? Because if they, they, it's supposed to be where they're at, but if we're not deploying our resources properly and they don't have the time to spend in that neighborhood because they have to go to the next neighborhood or the, across town or to the other side of town, to respond to an emergency call, they're not effectively able to community police. So it's a twofold argument that we have to make. One is that, yes, that's important to them, but we have to allow them the time and the resources to do that. And um, I feel like right now with the way that the deployment is working, we don't have that because of the need for them to deploy in different manners than what's the most proper way. So I agree with you, but I think it, I think to allow that to happen and to encourage that behavior, we have to provide that safe space for them to be able to do that as opposed to being filled feel like they're drawn in a hundred different ways. Exactly. And that's where your scheduling comes in. And that's why they're here. Yeah. <laughs> that's why we're all here. It's because exactly what you said is true. Yeah, that's true. Because I don't have to say a problem. You got to say, rather than thinking negative about people, there be something positive like a leave no trace class or something where it's a Pavlovian, like you get a reward for learning something. And I don't think any brain completely shuts off and forgets everything they learn. There's usually a few things. Like, I didn't notice a big, huge, giant mess. And those people went to leave no trace school and learned a little bit about how not to be so messy and, and just because it they don't realize they never learned it or they have that. reason to care. They just hit the but I just think they don't, they never so good they to can't. be able and then give them a feeling of good. Like I care they can't for conceive this. of that. They just get positive, positive, positive. They can't conceive of that. They're not but there. They They're them. not all there. If they could get into some kind of basic class, they will basic. But it's a positive reinforcement, like sure. call it something like getting home. Like you get home, you're, you're, you're on your way. You're 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 rather than the, rather than just the okay, we're in trouble when you did this. Take a look at Karma Box. Okay, you have a Karma Box. Take a look at Karma Box. They're doing exactly what you said. They have a, a, a pamphlet or a, an idea of, of retraining people that maybe aren't thinking in that direction to how to be. It's going to make some people angry, and I'm sorry I'm going to say it anyways. To how to be a better homeless person, how to be a member of the community that you're living in, even if you're experiencing homelessness, how to be a better person in that space. Karma Box has a program that they're working on, so it is there, and I think that might kind of be what you're talking about and looking at. And it's how to not, you know, do things that are going to cause disruption in the community. We understand people experience homelessness, but how do you, um, how do you do that in a more, um, a positive, a less obtrusive way, however it is, however you want to look at it, that isn't going to cause this issue. Take a look at Karma Box. They have that program going now, so it might be a good outreach for you. Well, it's not a nice to get but yeah, talk to um, Brand does a really good job of trying to do that re education piece, also. You realize that yeah, that's a portion of it. So, that's another thought. Because I, I am very sensitive about Oxbow. I used to take the uh, dynamic 
volunteered a year in my school one time. And um, I go to the place that we go to all the time. It was one of our best field trips. So, so decay, uh, I do have uh, strings into the parks and that and uh, I'll, I'm going to take a look at that because that's one of the more beautiful places that there. Yeah. So do we have something on that? We do not, but we have about 20 minutes left. Okay. So I want to make sure you've gotten all your questions. And then I saw some hands over here. Yeah, so hands, yes. I've already gone. Somebody else hasn't gone. I have somebody can go for this. Anybody else that has an opportunity? Sure. I live in a community in Atlanta, and a very nice community. We don't have any problems, and because we have limited resources for the police, I really can't see the need for them to have to be a presence in my area when there are areas that need extra help. You know, uh, when we when we first brought up that uh, map of San Jose, it looked like you had like an even number of officers everywhere. But communities aren't like that. Some need more help than others. So why not put the resources where they're really needed? The idea is that those neighborhoods get more police officers. <laughs> but okay. they all need to have an equal ability to be proactive. So it's more of a percentage based yeah. on the need of the community. So if you live in a community that doesn't need a lot of resources, we want to make sure if there's an emergency, we have the ability to respond to that. Right. But if the community next to you needs additional resources, so that's kind of how it looks is how do we right. get where um, we can still get to you in an emergency, but we're focused on a different area right then and easily redeployed. Um, so, so. Mm -hmm. uh, being a senior and kind of stuck in the 60s, <laughs> and so we call them, oh, go online and do bigger. Yeah, okay. Here we go. <laughs> Um, having non-officers come and help you fill out a report and not take them away from the more purposes that are going on. You have that now. Yeah, and, that's and, good. And, and uh, part of the study is to explore opportunities to do more of that, including online reporting or other kinds yeah. of uh, yeah. mechanisms. <laughs> Yeah, this is we've even taken our mobile show on the road and brought our front desk staff out and said, oh, you have a, they just went out to one of a, a senior community that had a series of vehicle break-ins and they didn't know how to report it online. So we took our front desk staff out there and they were able to make their reports for their insurance purposes and to document it in that way. So it's one of the things. And they're still aware of what's going yep. on. Right. Just people. Oh, it's like an alternate thing that we can do without having to tie up officers but still provide that service. Very good. So let's go here, here, and then here. One of the big elephants in the room that we're all going to have to deal with is we know we need more police, we need more fire service, and other things as well. There's going to be a tremendous cost associated with doing all that. And who's this going to hit? Us, the stakeholders that live and work here. If you own a home, you own a business. To get the police force and the fire department to the point where they need to be, we're all going to see significant tax increases unless the people that leave the town figure out some other way to do it. And the way it's going to happen is the easiest way that's going to raise our property tax. So let's be prepared for it. If we get what we want, we're going to pay for it. Two of these will go up too. Um, Sir, you have a your hand raised. Yes, uh, will the study be used? Just to said it right. Can you all increase in the number of full time employees for the police department? We currently, uh, I believe the staff names are 442 full time, but there was a sign of control of actually about 218 based on our population report around 272,000 from 2022. So, does that comport with other cities in terms of the officer to population ratio? And how many beats will we establish or reduce based on this? And the, the chief fact of the reduction of disposals are based on the lack of uh, federal assistance in the coming years. Yeah. So every city's different. San Jose is different from Las Vegas. It's different from any city that's around. Officers per thousand is a poor way of looking at it because of that. Um, so what we look at is we start from principles like how busy do you want your uh, officers to be and how responsive can they be? Um, so we look carefully at the call for service workload and figure out how highly committed officers are right now in doing that. 
and what that residual time we've been talking about proactivity the whole time unless they have something like 40 or 45 percent of their time to be proactive they don't have the time to do any of the things that most people have been talking about in this so we build a patrol course around <laughs> concepts of proactivity and arising from that ability to respond effectively to high priority calls and things like that so and that answer is going to be different for every community. So that's where our work comes in and figuring that out. So that's where that's what we're doing right now. Some of those answers in terms of calls for service are actually from your public safety dispatchers, who not part of the police department, mm -hmm. or the other staff part of the city manager's office. We still pull them. We have access. We pull out that data. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where data comes. So I guess the dispatchers for public safety uh, in terms of the police department. Probably would tell the officers you have 15 calls stacked. Yeah. And then do they in turn redistribute those calls or is the essentially the broken ministry out the window, so to speak? Yeah, no, that that's the problem that a police department has, like where you know, where there appears to be a, a staffing imbalance, is that you come onto your shift uh, about now and uh all of a sudden there's 20 calls pending from the previous shift. And you're going to be playing this game of which one's most important while new calls are coming in. And that that's not the right way to run it. Well, I thought the chief said that she was unsure of why the shifts were set. The way that the way that's the right. Usually the shifts is an overlap or you have a tactical response. Or, or an overlapping or shift or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that the, the point is that I, we, I don't know that we are deploying in the manner that's most effective given all of the things that you've talked about calls for service reports areas of town where the needs are based um are the officers days off um, coinciding with their needs for mental health and wellness and also for um court and training and those things that come into it so there's a lot of, it's not an easy calculation i can't just do some simple math and say this is where we should be um, that's why I need the bigger look at where our needs are and how we can better serve this. So that's why we're looking at it. And that's what I mean. I, I don't know that we're doing it the best that we can right now. My guess is no, um, but I don't know what the answer is to make it better, which is why the consultant is here. Um, our current staffing number is 354. Authorized strength. We are operating with about a 7% vacancy right now. Um, and is we fill positions based on retirements, which is primarily what um, our vacancy rate, our attrition is, is retirements. Um, I can't really have more than 20 officers in a training at any given time because of the amount of resources it takes to properly train them and the one-on-one -on -one training that it takes. So I have to be mindful of hiring over what my capacity to train is. And I think that's when departments get in trouble when they start looking at just trying to get X number of officers without looking at what that training goes into um, for them. And the last thing I want is to somebody to be poorly trained and then have uh, repercussions because of it. So just so you know, just that's a top talking point about 20 officers about all I can have in training in any given time. Yeah, that's for service training or post. No, that's for their their training for to be on their own full time. That's through the their training program after the academy. Who set the performance standards, performance measures for the department for an emergency response in less than five minutes? I'm sorry, what was that question? Who set the performance measure for the police department for the police to respond to emergency calls less than five minutes? Where did the performance standard come from? Yes. Which performance standard? I know what you're saying, but where did you get that information? What's it? Online. Exactly. Right here. Well, the goal is in the standard uh, responses that police departments should try to be at, a, at a, an emergency situation within five minutes. I mean, that's the optimum time. We're lucky here if we get to a space where it's an actual, the emergencies vary. So there's priority one calls that are maybe not in progress or threat of life or death that we might have a longer response time to, but the things that somebody is at risk of of being of life or death right then, those have a much lower response time. Where we're really lucky here is um, being in a regional position. Uh, when those types of calls like shootings and homicides or officer involved shootings come out, we do have the ability to utilize a regional response to make sure that we do have that response time down. That, that is a common performance standard. It is very common. But I'd say a lot of agencies are challenged to meet that. And also there's no uniform way of categorizing calls. 
So I think that, that we've got like a priority room call. It's an emergency call. We have it. We want to get there sooner, but there is a big difference between a priority one call of maybe a missing juvenile that isn't at risk or in danger, which still we want to get to before we do something else, or an active shooting scene. So there's two different types of priority one calls. They all get lumped into one basket, so it's hard to always differentiate. But I will tell you that looking at the response of when it's a life or death situation, our response time is generally well under the five minutes. The, the, the other factor, and you brought this up earlier in response to your question, is that there are a lot of resources in the central part of the city, and maybe you can get that standard pretty consistently. But do you reach it in the outlying areas where there are fewer resources? Well, so that's what we're looking for. I'm not sure your officers are trained to you know, identify traffic. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it is. It's not easy. Yep. Um, yeah, I just very quickly wanted to touch base, be able to touch base with you and Audrey afterwards. To there was a article that was came out by Reno PD from Commander Bond about um, being able to partner with uh, retailers yes. on organized retail crime, and there's just opportunities with that right now. And I just wanted to be able to bring or talk to you guys about it. And again, a lot of those we we expect it's kind of like the community groups. We expect those businesses um, to want that response because there are some businesses that want a hands-off approach to organized retail theft. Right. And so if the businesses drive that desire, we are more than happy to help them with the, with that response. So please, yes, let's yeah. Know. And Audrey knows me, so he knows I'm all about. <laughs> ORC and everything very passionate. Yeah. So I mean, we are, um, and but it, again, there's some businesses, and everybody has to understand that that they just have decided that they take a hands-off approach to theft, mm -hmm. and we can't um, go in and say, you know, you have to report theft to us or allow us to to do an enforcement mission in your business because it's they have to be the victims of that crime and allow us to to do that space. Right. Absolutely. Um, we have a question online. Robert, do you want to unmute? Oh, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Um, yeah, I this discussion, it just kind of brought, it prompted my question. Are there people available? In, it's similar to like the medical profession where you have interns or people that are can be trained to do the minor um the, answer the minor questions or attend to the minor issues so that the more senior officers can attend to the critical issues. Um, I mean, even business offices do things like that to, you know, to uh, allow these people to learn, but also to be valuable support staff. I think support staff is important too, not just the, the officers that go through the academies. They need that relief too. So as you say, they can get their mental health time off too and, and not have to deal with um, the, the minor issues. So many, if I can take a shot at that. Go for it. Sure. So many, many departments around the country, Reno included, have civilian paraprofessionals, uh, community services officers are called here and in many communities. And their job is to do exactly what you said is to respond to cold calls that maybe happened sometime in the past, uh, minor crimes, quality of life types of things. Uh, and uh, communities that use this kind of system uh, very well can uh, have 10, 15, even 20% of their calls uh, alternatively responded in that way. And what that does is it gets the response that's appropriate to the type of event that's happening, but also frees up police officers to use their skills, training, and abilities to focus on different kinds of problems. I think the only other thing I would add to that is that um, we do have a, a very robust front desk staff, so they're a police service specialist. So if you do an online report, they can follow up with you if there's any suspect information or anything like that. So obviously not an in-progress crime, but something that has happened um, in the past or something that isn't an emergency. And or you can go into the police department. And I know the parking's challenging. We're moving in the summer, so it'll be better then. Uh, 
So don't yell at me about the parking, I'm sorry. Uh, but you can go into the police department to report crimes also, and the front desk staff will take that report for you and guide yeah. you through that process, yeah. which leaves officers on the street handling other calls. So it's kind of exactly like you, you said. Um, I will say that my expectation is that every sworn member of the department uh, can go out there and handle every call for service in a manner that's going to be sufficient, uh, regardless of tenure. So once they get trained, they, we know that there's guiding and mentoring and things like that, but they, we do have an expectation of that. But as we grow our department, growing our professional staff members, the ones that aren't the sworn members, is just as important for that support services. So we are proportionately growing the department as we add full-time employee positions. You had a question over here? Um, I live right on Trucky River. It's uh, right across from a bunch of condos on the river. But um, the other day, there was a big limb stuck in the middle of the river. And I have a feeling someone saw the limb from a condo and called it in because they could look down on it. But I counted three fire trucks and nine human beings there to get that thing out. Is there any crossover for like maybe everybody and this was busy, but there's nine extra guys in here that oh, girl, women. So you could fit that maybe some of that they're already professionals, they already kind of know what we need. Please don't call the police for the yeah. <laughs> well, uh, um, uh, packs. There's a lot of them all together at once. Like, it's me and I by ourselves out there, and it's a pack of firemen. I'm like, oh, that's a good teaching experience. Like, tell them I said that. They, I think there's a capacity number in that fire truck, and they aim to hit it every time. Like, I have six seats in my car, and it's one of me all the time. There's six in the back of there, six firemen in there. All right, I'm done making fun of firemen. I go. <laughs> you can tell me I said that. It's okay. Luckily, the fence is I would have done it in front of them. <laughs> all right, we have about five minutes left. Is there anything else that you haven't gotten from this community that you can? All right, we've got one more hand. Oh, all right. This could be the last hand. I just want to say thank you so much for hosting this. I came in here with my own problem, but I really learned so much about um, everything that everyone else is going to. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming here and spending a large part of your afternoon here today uh, talking to us. We heard a lot of positive things about the police department, uh, about how their willingness to work and just how they are working with the community. We heard some challenges too, uh, some based on staffing and other kinds of issues that uh, we appreciate your input on this. So thank you. Uh, I have a hard copy handouts of the slideshow we did. I was going to say you should have had me. Yeah, I know. Well, that way, but everybody, reads them everybody would have been looking at that. Yeah, I'm not giving you an excuse. I'm going to let you talk. Thank you. We also right, have so a few more meetings. Anyone yeah. who is interested in okay. hearing more, we have two more meetings. Um, they are on the City of Reno calendar. One is in person at City Hall, the other one is totally virtual. So if you want to talk more about this, you're welcome to attend those as well. If you have a friend that wants to talk about it, and then really, I mean, pay attention to the, the stuff that we post because we are trying to get more community meetings, more things going. And, and just watch out for all the stuff that's coming because we've we've been pretty busy. It's been fun. So the other in-person meeting is at City Hall next Tuesday at six o'clock. I yep. think yep. Tuesday. And then the other the other virtual one is Thursday at Thursday what time? At eleven, I think. Eleven a.m. Okay. Check so this one you're gonna be at Chief What? The one at Tuesday. Tuesday at six o'clock yeah. at City Hall. City Hall. Yeah, I, this is a quiz. Um, and then Thursday at nine thirty. We're going to be there. Oh, I was... well, I thought it was a good yeah, when it was. I'm like, I don't, think... <laughs> don't ask me too many questions.